You are listening to the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience. Welcome to another episode of the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience. Today, we have probably one of our most accomplished guests in the short history of the podcast. She's a prominent member of the feminist community who has had her works published in the Harvard Business Review, Huffington Post, Washington Post, and the New York Times. She currently is a distinguished law professor at the University of California, Hastings Law School, and has also authored or co-authored six books from detailing the struggles women face in the workplace to breaking down the white working class. She started the Center for Work-Life Law as a way to help women find success in their jobs. So please join me in welcoming our guest today, joining us via the phone, Joan C. Williams. Hello, Williams. Hi, Joan. It's Mark Guzman. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Let's get started here. I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I'm really excited because we have a lot to discuss in a very short amount of time. And let's just jump right into it. So let's talk about your background and education. Well, I am, uh, I'm kind of a caricature. I, I'm strictly a silver spoon girl um, on, on both sides of my family. And I uh, went to Yale, Harvard, and MIT. So I am, uh, I know what I call the professional managerial elite because I definitely come from it. Okay. And what were your some of your early inspirations or role models growing up? You know, I was um I was I grew was born in nineteen fifty two, so I didn't have a lot of role models going growing up because there just weren't a lot of women who were in positions of authority. So I I was one of the generations that just didn't have many people to um to model myself after. Are there any that any role models that you look up to now or that you see coming up that um, really inspire you? Well, I mean, there are a lot of people I admire um, and from a very you know broad walks of life. Uh, I'll just name one absolutely arbitrarily is I think Van Jones is a very smart, um, balanced, <clears throat> measured uh voice of sanity in an often insane world. Mm -hmm. Now, you currently teach at UC Hastings Law School, is that correct? Yes. And what kind of law do you focus on? I focus on employment law, and then I also teach leadership. Okay. Now, that employment law transfers over to what you currently do with work-life law, is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> For many years, I have been very focused on guaranteeing equal access to employment to people based on gender, based on race, based on whether or not they have kids. That's been the focus of mine for decades. Now, you were one of the co-founders. Is that right? I was one of the co-founders of the original project for gender work and family way back when. But work-life law kind of transmuted into something quite different, and um, uh, and so I, it's, I think it's fair to say I founded work-life law. Okay, in approximately what year? Late nineteen nineties. Okay, and what motivated you to start that? I was uh, I had become a mother and. Um, almost dropped out after my son was born because it was so unbelievably difficult to to uh, combine work and family. And I wanted to make the world into a place where men as well as women could do both. So we worked, from the beginning, we worked with employers um, to <clears throat> help them conceptualize and develop and implement policies that help with that. And we also uncovered the fact that there was a huge, at the, in the late 1990s, a huge amount of very open discrimination against mothers. And we developed the area of law that means that it's now clearly recognized as 
gender discrimination to discriminate against mothers. More recently, we've also focused very significantly significantly on <clears throat> discrimination against men when they try to take an active role in family care. So that's all what we call family responsibilities discrimination. Yeah, and we've definitely seen a lot more men recently taking parental leave when they have a newborn. Indeed, indeed. And in fact, we run a, we've long run a hotline for employees who feel they've encountered family responsibilities discrimination. And a few years ago, we began to have a sharp increase in the number of men who um, call us, either because they've been denied parental leave or penalized for taking it, or uh, we've also had a sharp increase in the number of people calling us because of elder care responsibilities. Okay. So how, how does work-life law help individuals? So someone contacts you, what's the next step? How does that, um, how does that happen? Well, we do it in several different ways. Um, we do have a hotline, and it would be great if you could post the number to our hotline. Sure, um, what is it? Um, it is not on my the list. That, oh, here it is, 415-703-8276. Perfect, we'll go ahead That's and link it up. That's the hotline. Yeah, that's the hotline for people who encounter discrimination based on family responsibilities, um, discrimination at work based on family responsibilities. So we've run a hotline for a really long time. Um, <clears throat> we also do uh, run a, uh, uh, have a, an attorney network called the Work-Life Law Attorney Network of um, plaintiffs, employment lawyers who handle family responsibilities, discrimination cases. And we um, also work with employers and with um, pregnant workers through a website called Pregnant at Work. We have a lot of resources there for workers who are pregnant and want to know what their legal rights are and for employers who are trying to accommodate um, to give pregnant workers the simple kinds of simple accommodations they typically need in order to remain um, uh, at work. And we also work with students through a website called The Pregnant Scholar because too often students who, these are university and graduate students, who get pregnant are forced out of their programs and deprived of their fellowships when they become pregnant. So those are some of the, the things that we do in the employment law arena. In addition, we work with where we have a working group where we're bringing together um, employ lawyers who represent employers um, in order to have them understand how they can keep diversity metrics with uh, in a way that controls for the possible legal risks of doing that. Okay. What are some examples of discrimination that pregnant workers are facing today? Well, at the, at the most um, blatant level, one, one low-wage worker told her boss that she was pregnant. She was fired 15 minutes later. So that's, wow. that's pretty, that's pretty bla I mean, it, that's pretty shocking that this, that still happens um, in this day and age. So uh, another common, uh, all too common occurrence is that uh, a woman will get pregnant and um, need a, a simple accommodation in order to stay at work. An example is that um, when you're um, far enough along, a doctor does not want you standing for eight hours a day because your circulation changes when you're pregnant. And so a cashier would need a simple, simple accommodation like a stool. Um, <clears throat> and in, sometimes employers, instead of giving the cashier a stool, which does not seem to be very difficult, um, would prefer to force her out on early family medical leave, which means that after four months, she'll, she, she basically will be fired because she can't come back to her job because she's at that point um, has a, 
uh, is just about to give birth often. So that's another common example. Sometimes mothers, um, women who find that their employers are very, treat them and everybody else super flexibly when uh, before they have children. Sometimes when mothers have children, all of a sudden employers begin to hyper scrutinize everything they do and, and um, say you have to register me every time you take your kid to the doctor or mm-hmm. things like that. And then often sometimes fathers who who um, ask for parental leave are told things like, you know, who wears the pants in your family? Isn't that something your wife is going to do, which is direct evidence of gender discrimination. So there's um, a, a lot of, a, a, a lot of, um, you know, you would think this stuff is, was pretty easy at this late date, but um, a lot of people come with uh, employers who have behaved in, in just ways that strike me as hard to understand. Yeah. Now, family responsibilities also fall into that. And one of the things that pops into my mind is even my own team here at my office. Um, you know, a few women here have children and they need to go pick up their kid sometimes at two o'clock midday. I have absolutely zero problem with that. Is that a problem that you also see where kind of what you mentioned, the employers will scrutinize when they take their children to a doctor visit or they have to pick them up from school or something like that? Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, if the employer hyper-scrutinizes everybody and has very rigid schedules for everybody, then um, the the mothers who want to take their kid to a doctor's office uh, sometimes have very little recourse. But what we often find is that employers are quite flexible, for example, in the context of salespeople. They don't keep close track of who's who's where, when, when, um, except for a mother. And then they get very rigid, and that's where the employer runs into legal problems. Got it. Now, I also saw on the website for Work Life Law that you guys also specialize in schedule stability. Now, explain that a little bit more and the different studies you've done and what what that really means. This has to do with the fact that many hourly workers have uh, work what are called just-in-time schedules. And just-in-time schedules really um, wreak havoc on people's work-life balance because very often your schedule, it typically it's a part-time schedule and you work different shifts every single day and um, different days every single week. Um, and so your schedule this week looks nothing like your schedule last week. And often you get like three days notice um, of what your schedule is going to be for next week. So that, that, uh, basically makes life impossible for a whole series of people. Mm-hmm. Um, number one, um, people, adults with family responsibilities, you can't arrange for childcare if you don't know what on earth, what hours you're going to be working, and what day is next week. Number two is students. I mean, students have often paid good money, often lots of it, for classes, but they, and they have to, they don't want to miss their classes. Um, and then third is since a lot of these are part-time schedules, very often people on these just-in-time schedules have two different jobs, both of which have just-in-time schedules. And the jobs end up interfering with one another, which means that um, it's really, it's really a, a harsh economic situation for people who are depending on um, their jobs Number one, they never know with these schedules how many hours they're going to be getting in a given week or a given month. And number two, the hours they do get may conflict between their two jobs. So it's really a very serious problem for many, many hourly workers, particularly in retail, hospitality, and healthcare. Yeah, and they can be in struggle if they are both on or if they're on call for both jobs and they get hit up at the same time. They don't attend one job 
um, because they can only be in one place and then they get fired from yep. that job they couldn't attend. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so in order to study this more, I mean, advocates have been arguing for a while that these kinds of just-in-time schedules are um, not fair to workers. Um, but what I wanted to know is whether they're um, good for businesses, uh, because obviously if they're if this is the only way, for example, a retailer can realistically staff their store, then, you know, it is what it is. And so I approached the Gap retailer here in San Francisco and proposed a pilot where we would shift a whole group of stores to more stable schedules, which that was about four years ago, <clears throat> which we did. We ran what's only the second randomized controlled experiment of just-in-time schedules for our for um, low-wage workers that in that's that's ever been done to my knowledge and just later in um, early very early in the new year we'll be putting out a report about the results the report the the the, the experiment had really very dramatic findings um, which unfortunately are not finalized or public yet, but stay tuned. Okay. Interesting. I'm interested to see what the results uh, uh, turn out to be. Yeah, I'd be glad to uh, to check back in <clears throat> once they're out. Yeah, perfect. Now, you've authored and co-authored approximately six books, I believe, and um, let's talk about a few of the books, and I believe you have one book that came out this year, called The White Working Class. And now you wrote a book called What Works for Women at Work. And this was you and your daughter focus on four patterns working women need to know. Let's talk a little bit about those patterns and how women can navigate the workplace. Okay. Um, well, I wrote What Works for Women at Work basically because I wanted young women to know everything I didn't know when I was coming up um, and paid a pretty high price for not knowing. The studies show that um, the level of gender bias, the same is true of race, by the way, but let's talk about gender for the moment. Um, the level of gender bias really hasn't uh, diminished in many ways. These subtle um, patterns of implicit bias remain far too common. And um, they're pretty unchanging. I mean, they, they were there when I was coming up, and they're still there today, sad to say. And so um, I, um, I have studied exactly how gender bias tends to play out in professional workplaces and began to give a talk called The Four Patterns of Gender Bias, which left women really feeling very glum because when I describe these patterns, they go like, yeah, all of that happened to me. So then I started to interview very successful women to say, um, any, have these patterns happened to you? Have you seen gender bias in your career? 96% had. And what are some of the ways that have helped you navigate successfully through these patterns of gender bias? Because these were all very, very successful women. And that's what works for women at work. We basically... The, the findings of my research are that gender bias is alive and well in professional workplaces, and, but that women can survive and thrive if they're about twice as politically savvy as men. And so I just took all of that savvy and put it in a book that I wrote with my daughter, Rachel Dempsey, and women have found it really, really helpful. It has very, very concrete and very... Um, low risk and politically attuned strategies for navigating through gender bias, and it also it makes it it also provides a palette, not a um, you know a one size fit all fits all because people's personalities are different, their their um, their situations are different. And so uh, we actually are just now coming out with a what works. For women at work workbook to help women do things like how do you 
build a professional network that's going to help your career, given that research shows that it's harder for women to have uh, a network that's truly um, business appropriate and business helpful. So I think it's just really important to take this deep research base and to boil it down into really, really concrete, um, uh, doable steps that people can take. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we fix some of these problems? Because one of the issues, too, that women face is the pressure to prove competence in the workplace. And they could be extremely yeah, right. more qualified than, than you know, a male in this exact same role, yet they have to prove competence. And it seems like two or three times as much. I mean, how, yeah, how, do, we, how, do, we right. fix, how do we fix this? How can right. a woman navigate through that? Well, unfortunately, a lot of what the um, and this is this is a, one of these patterns that's triggered by race as well as by gender. So basically, women are seen as less good a fit for high level professional jobs, and so are um, and so are blacks and Latinos. So this is triggered by race as well as by gender. And there's lots of research that shows that those groups often have to provide more evidence of competence. Um, than white men in order to be seen as equally competent. And so, um, unfortunately, uh, I mean, organizations should interrupt this bias, and we have, a, we have open source tools to help organizations do exactly that, to interrupt this bias in performance evaluations, to interrupt the bias in, in assignments. So those are at um, www.biasinterrupters.org. But... You know, if your organization isn't doing that, then, you know, what we found from the women is women did a couple things. Number one, they just proved themselves over and over again. Not fair, you know, but as I always say, that's like a different book. What should work for women at work, not what does. Um, and then, two, it's really important to keep track if people are going to tend to overlook your successes and remember your mistakes, which is what the literature shows, you have to remind them. So it's really important to keep careful real-time records of all of the objective metrics in your workplace environment that you've met. And to do that, you have to figure out what those metrics are and then spend the time to show that you've absolutely nailed them. And then you need to get the word out to your network of mentors, sponsors, and allies to show to so that they are armed. So when people go like, well, I don't know if she's ready for that promotion to go like, well, she nailed A, B, C, and D. I think she's ready. Uh, unfortunately, you need to, you need to arm your, your, your network um, that way so that they can counter that bias if it's brought up in your case. And every single one of those strategies I just named was also effective um, for, for people of color as well as for women of all races. So what you mentioned there is exactly what you said just a few minutes ago, that women have to be twice as politically savvy because a lot of that is just really politics and making sure people understand what you've accomplished, how well of a job you've done so that you could build support so that they support you. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you also need to um, to show, I mean, the, a man may do – one thing well and then people will assume that it's evidence that he has potential and is, is ready to take the next step with women can do one, a woman can do one thing well and the assumption will be well she did that one thing well now she now she needs to you know do it over so i can make sure have confidence that she does that one thing well but even then sometimes it won't be assumed that she can take the next step it will just be um, be, be seen as evidence that she can do that one thing well. Now we know she has that nailed. And so you need um, to spend a lot more time um, dem you know, basically proving yourself. And this is, there's an old African-American saying, it's like, you know, you have to try on twice as hard to get half as far. And I'm not saying that's true every place, but there are elements of truth to that in far too many professional workplaces. Now, um, one thing I've seen, and I want to get into masculine tendencies by women, 
um, because I've seen this personally myself. My girlfriend um, for probably five or six years was in the bodybuilding world where, you know, you work out a lot, you diet, train, and then you go on stage and people judge you. And, and just being in the gym and working out, the number of negative comments that she received just because she was trying to build more muscle or she was trying to get leaner or she was doing weights heavier than men and the negative comments mm-hmm. that she received are just like unbelievable to me and and you see it a lot in the bodybuilding world a lot of the women deal with just negative feedback on social media all the time now yeah in a workplace how does that translate how do what happens there in a workplace well, that's part of a different pattern of gender bias. The, what we've been talking about is, is competence-based bias, what I call prove it again. Um, what you're talking about here is what we call the tightrope, where, um, to use your example, I mean, the, when you think of a body, you, know, you, you think of a, um, a bodybuilder, builder, you think of somebody masculine. Um, and so women to be seen as, bodybuilders have to behave in masculine ways, but then they're not being feminine, which is what women are supposed to be. So what you, what you are, are talking about there is women having to walk this tightrope between being seen as too masculine and therefore not likable or somehow weird um, and too feminine and therefore just not qualified. Um, and that also happens in professional workplaces uh, where women who are, women display, you know, you can have somebody displaying behavior and if he's a man, it's evidence of leadership potential. Um, and, uh, but if it's a woman, it's evidence that um, she's not a team player because she's not, she's not, um, she's insisting on the center stage in a way that's unseemly. So uh, that tightrope is one that actually it is the most commonly reported type of gender bias in my interviews, uh, and it's 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 it affects anybody um, <clears throat> like your girlfriend who's trying to become accomplished in a traditionally masculine domain. If she does, she's seen as too masculine and insulted for being weird or not womanly or not feminine or something. So what's the answer? I mean, basically, again, the answer is that this shouldn't happen, that if you have a workplace where success is defined in masculine terms, women should be able to just do what men do in that workplace. That's the answer. But the strategy, if you have a workplace that's, that's not not evolved there yet is what I call gender judo and gender judo is basically uh, uh, doing a masculine thing but in a feminine way in order to try to avoid backlash Um, so if you are um, negotiating for salary for example uh, negotiating hard is seen as very appropriate for a man because men are supposed to be competitive and ambitious. So he's just showing he's like a man to be reckoned with. But if a woman uh, negotiates hard, she will often tend to be seen as not a team player and maybe disliked. And so the gender judo strategy, and this actually is, the, there are literally the studies that show that this is what, that is what works is um, if women are negotiating, they, um, they attribute it to like, well, I, it's really important for me to negotiate in order that my team knows that I'm standing up for them. Um, or it's really important for me to negotiate because my mentor told me that it was that I should negotiate starting salary and also negotiate to be re- to be considered for a salary step in six months rather than 12 months. So the first is that I'm, you know, I'm just a selfless team player. And the second is I'm such a good girl um, deferring to my mentor. So women, unfortunately, what they have to do is like call on feminine stereotypes, the type that typically hold women back 
but then use that feminine stereotype to propel them forward. Here's another example. This is actually from a, one of the few women tech CEOs uh, at the time. She said, well, this is what I do. She said, I warm this mother 90% of the time so that the 10% of the time when I need to be tough, I can be. Now, a male CEO can just be tough 100% of the time, and that's showing leadership qualities. Uh, but if a female CEO is tough 100% of the time, you better believe that her name is going to be, begin with a big B, and that's not going to be a career-enhancing move. So that's the tightrope and um, the, what the strategies women, successful women typically use to try to navigate that is, uh, is gender judo. Okay. Now, to, and again, I mean, I guess to fix this, it's really educating society, educating the public, getting the word out there and helping give women um, the resources for them to report activities like this or uh, give them the skills to then, you know, do, um, do the gender judo to navigate the workplace? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the solution, um, quite simply, is, um, I mean, just to give you an example, again, going back to these bias interrupters toolkits, there was one study of women in tech, a formal study that found that um, you know, that 66% of the women's performance evaluations, but only 1% of men's, faulted them for having personality problems. That's one of the things that happens to women on the tightrope. Um, one, of these, um, one of these evaluations said she needs to step back and give others a chance to shine. In other words, she has to be a modest, self-effacing team player, not a brilliant contributor or a, a showing, showing leadership qualities, right? So if, um, if an organization is not monitoring your performance evaluations to pick up situations where women are faulted for personality problems in contexts where men aren't, um, then you're just, you're constantly being, you're constantly transmitting tightrope bias through your performance evaluations. And so the solution is to understand that this is a common type of, type of bias and to start, um, start training people not to do that. And, um, providing them feedback when they do uh, uh, give, give feedback that reflects uh, gender bias. And that's exactly what those gender bias um, toolkit, the gender bias toolkit of for, for interrupting bias in performance evaluations does. So that's the real solution um, in its absence Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and link up that gender bias uh, toolkit in the description also. Now, let's talk about the women who support President Trump right now. And despite having a long history of negative activity against women, he still beat Hillary by 28 points when looking at the female demographic. Why do you think this happened? And I believe this would tie into your latest book, The White Working Class. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, why this happened is, I mean, the, the reason that Trump won is because uh, he got 77,000 crucial votes in four Rust Belt states, chiefly among what is typically called the white working class. And I'll call them that here, but they really aren't working class. They're really the middle class in the United States. Um, the middle class in the United States has really um, gotten, faced very harsh economic conditions in the past few decades. And a lot of them um, are either have either fallen out of the middle class or are fearful that they will. And that's why that economic anxiety is widely shared by men as well as women. Um, what happened is that the men lost high paying blue collar jobs. And that has been really terrible for the men. It's made them feel really terrible about themselves. Um, unemployed men are usually 
super bummed out or men who are doing jobs that they consider to be far beneath them. Um, it's also had a really harsh impact on working class women because um, although in professional jobs you've seen a lot of movement of women into traditionally men's jobs, that's not true in, um, in these middle class blue collar jobs. Typically the good jobs with high wages have remained almost universally um, by, held by men. And that means that the the women in those those working class families also depended on those blue collar jobs because their pink collar jobs didn't pay very much and typically don't have much upward potential. And so the economic the, the massive loss of high paying blue collar jobs has been deeply distressing not only to working class men but also working class women. And um, that, that's one really important factor that drove working, uh, white working class women to vote, uh, <clears throat> to vote for Trump. Uh, another thing that happened is that Hillary, Hillary Clinton, and you know, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat, I voted for her, I worked for her, but she wasn't, she was pretty class clueless. Um, she talked a lot about the glass ceiling. Well, if you think about it, what does that metaphor mean? It means that silver spoon girls like me should be able to get the same jobs that our fathers had or our husbands have. Why should working class people care? They don't. They don't. Now, if Hillary Clinton had focused more on sexual harassment than on the glass ceiling, I think her candidacy might have done um, a better job at holding more of these white working class women. So, I mean, uh, if you think about the black community, the racism is so salient in the black community that um, that it that's they 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 remain very loyal to to Democrats for that reason. Um, but in many other ways, the black community and other communities of color are a whole heck of a lot more like the white working class than they are like the college educated elite. They're much more traditional. Um, they're much more open to um, religion. They're much more traditional in terms of their family values, um, in terms of even some of these communities, notably Latinos, much more um, like uh, like. Uh, traditional on issues related to reproductive rights. Yeah, so it really comes down to a class divide. And um, between two articles, um, you wrote a piece for the Harvard Business Review and another one for the New York Times. And um, I think the way you broke it down, like just hit it right on the nail, where Republicans are about bringing back American jobs, whether you know, they can make it happen or not. That's kind of their yeah. main topic point. And then on the Democrats, you know, it's a wide range of topics that, you know, are important topics, but at the core for many people, what they really care for themselves and their families are stable jobs, stable lives, um, basically their own economics. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, you know, as I always say, the the working class of all colors wants what um, the college-educated elite, by and large, already has, which is a job that will, where they can work hard and gain their vision of a middle-class life. That's what most Americans want. That's even what poor folks want, by and large. And the Republicans... Um, and I speak as a Democrat, the Republicans, they have an, an answer to why the good jobs left trade treaties. They have an answer to why the jobs that remain are low paid immigrants. And they have a solution for all of it, tax cuts. Now, I don't believe that that's an accurate analysis or, um, and I don't believe that tax cuts are going to be an effective fix. But if Democrats don't want that to be the only story around, they've got to offer a different story. And they aren't. They aren't doing that effectively. Yeah, and they need to change something around for 2018 and, of course, the 
2020 election. From your lips to God's ears. Now, you mentioned in your in one of your essays that women don't stand together and this was in refer now was this actually in reference to the election because i didn't uh, i did read and i believe it was in the new york times where you mentioned that if women voted 50-50 for trump and hillary that hillary would have would have won and yeah. Yeah. and so was this was that comment in reference to the election or do you think it goes deeper than that It goes much deeper. I mean, the comment was in in reference to the election, but the the we've talked about two of the basic patterns of gender bias. um, Prove it again, and the tightrope. The third is the maternal wall gender bias based on motherhood. But the the fourth pattern I call tug of war, and that's when gender bias against women fuels conflict among women, and it's it's very common in some workplaces, although far from universal. For example, um, if one, if you have an environment where there, there's only room for one woman on a cherished committee or a cherished position in, in a department, then women are obviously going to fight with each other in order to, uh, and try to undercut each other so they can get that one cherished position. That's not proof that women are witchy queen bees, that's just a symptom of gender bias in the environment. Or if you have a situation where the only way to get ahead is to be one of the guys and align with the guys against the girls, then you're going to have women who do that. Um, One one well-known person here in the Bay Area is uh, Marissa Meyer. When she was at Google, she said, I'm not a girl at Google. I'm a geek at Google. So you notice how she's distancing herself from the out-group girls and aligning herself with the in-group geeks. That's called strategic distancing, and it's not uncommon in environments where women um, still have a fragile hold that are very male-dominated. Again, that's not evidence of a personality problem. That's a symptom of gender bias. Okay. Now, now, in your opinion, how can we fix this class divide? Does it really come down to bridging the gap, the economic gap between the poor, the middle class, and the rich? I think there's there's several very clear steps. Number one is the college-educated elite should stop stereotyping and um, deriding um, white middle-class men through stereotypes like Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson is a blue-collar guy who is seen as bumbling, clumsy, fat, dim-witted. That's not the kind of stereotype that we would tolerate in the racial context, and we shouldn't tolerate it in the class context either. If you insult people, they get insulted. That's the first step. Um, the, the second step is that um, the elites need to understand, need to actually care about the economic future of the two-thirds of Americans without, who are not college graduates. Um, until they do, um, those two-thirds of Americans are um, going to be pretty upset. Uh, so those are really two super simple steps is stop insulting people and um, start caring about the economic prospects of Americans without college degrees. And then the third is, third is a harder one. The third takes a leap of imagination. The elite needs to understand that what it considers to be um, sources of honor and sources of pride are uh, for it, like being edgy, being disruptive, everything artisanal, those are very parochial folk ways that make sense in the elite, and they don't make sense in the um, for the broad middle classes in the United States. I mean, in blue and pink collar jobs, being disruptive gets you one thing, and that's fired. And so the elite needs to understand that what it considers to be culturally valuable and cool is just in in some ways, I hate to say it, but it's darn true, an expression of their own class privilege. And they should stop looking down on people who 
um, have a high respect for traditional religion, traditional family values, who prefer the tried and true over the edgy, because those are the things that make sense in the context of the working class, regardless of race. You know, that makes total sense because I see it every and pretty much every day where people are pushing their kids to, you know, go to college, become a doctor, a lawyer, become, you know, some corporate, you know, CEO, CFO or something. And they look at people that are plumbers or electricians or mechanics as, oh, they didn't make it in life. And that's why they're doing those jobs. And exactly. yeah, and, and that's not the case. I mean, there are people who love being plumbers, who love being electricians. And as a society, we need people like that, you know, that are skillful yeah. at all those different occupations. And no, I mean, you're a hundred percent right on that. hundred percent right. Yeah. I mean, it's what I've been trying to explain to people is when I get up in the morning and I turn on the tap, it's not because there's some knowledge worker that water comes out. And that's pretty important to me. That's very important to my life. That is an important job. That is a skilled job. We need to give people who do that job the honor they deserve instead of making fun of them. For example, plumber's butt. It's just like, okay, that is an open class insult. And by the way, you have one too. Um, so I, I, I don't know. It's just like the stuff that people comes out of people's mouths sometimes. It's a mystery why they think that's appropriate. Yeah, I, I mean, my main occupation is real estate and property management, and you can have the world's most famous architect design the most amazing building, but guess what? That's not going to get built unless you have construction workers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, these are skilled jobs. And the fact is, you know, um, I'm just an old fashioned girl. I honor hard work, hard work. I honor it, whether it's a hotel housekeeper or whether it is a Mason or whether, whether it's some person writing code. And I think they're all important work. And uh, if you're willing to work hard, you should be able to create a solid middle-class life for yourself and your family. If more people believed and acted on that, our politics would be a lot more sane. Sounds good. Well, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. I know your book, White Working Class, came out this year. I know it's available for purchase on Amazon. Is there any other place where people can go and buy the book? Well, your local bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the, 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 what works for women at work, um, the original book is coming out any day now in paperback, and the workbook is going to be accompanying it too. So those also, uh, you should also look um, out for both of those coming soon. Great. Um, if you send me a link, we'll go ahead and link it up in the description for the podcast. So I want to thank you okay. so much for being on the show. And I look forward to hearing more. Well, first of all, I look forward to the upcoming book and look forward to also the study that you're doing with The Gap. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day -day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.